of African Liberties Monthly Webinar. My name is Anna Subeiru and I'll be hosting this session. And my colleague Ibrahim Anova will be supporting with tech in the background. Today we're going to be discussing a super important topic on why digital rights matter in Africa. And with me to discuss this topic, we have two amazing guests, Ridwan Oloyede and Juliet Namfuka. So before we begin, I'll just quickly read our guest bios. Juliet Namfuka is a research and communications expert at Collaboration and International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa, CIPESA. She generates content on developments impacting online rights, reviews and analyzes ICT policy and media interaction, and builds relationships with digital rights advocates. She holds a Bachelor of Journalism from Rhodes University. Juliet's work explores the connection between online rights and social innovation in Africa. Welcome, Juliet. Our second guest is Ridwan Oloyede. He's a legal practitioner whose practice specializes in research into cybersecurity, data protection, and data ethics. He's the data protection team lead at the Tech Hive Advisory. Ridwan is a policy advisor and analyst who has published policy briefs on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the impact of cross-border data. He has also worked on a privacy framework for the protection of the African child online. He's a member of the Internet Society of Nigeria and a research fellow at the African Academic Network on Internet Policy. So thank you both for being here. So um, we all know how important digital technologies are in the economy and also for education and just generally in life. But a little less understood aspect of the digital environment is the role that digital rights and data rights play. So for us to understand the importance of digital rights, I just like if Juliet, you could just give us a brief of your understanding or your opinion on how digital rights relates to other rights. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. And then greetings to everybody else in the room. Right. So digital rights in its most simplest understanding is the mirror of the rights that we enjoy in the offline world. Um, today, digital rights are an extension or rather an enabler of offline rights, but they too have brought in their own um, rather complex uh, dynamics as well. But um, we see digital rights as an enabler of um, the rights that exist in the online, rather in the offline world. And we, we see that through that lens because digital allows for uh, borderlessness and as a result, a greater community that can advocate for the various rights, um, a greater community that is beyond borders at national level, regional level, um, identity. So um, we see that as an enabler for a, a, a diversity of of rights that should not be limited to what we understand as digital. We can, we're talking water rights, climate rights, um, traffic rights. You know, there's so many that, that can be pursued through the use of digital rights as an enabler because digital rights are essentially a mirror, but an extension of um, the human aspect, the human lived experience rather. And it's an element of uh, the lived experience that we should employ to further both digital and offline rights. All right, thanks for that, Juliet. So basically digital rights encompasses everything and it's like a mirror of our realities, even in real life, even when we're offline. So um, before we move on to read one's opinion on digital rights and how it relates with freedom and especially with regards to the law to our audience, if you have any questions for the guests, you could just use the Q&A section and then we'll attend to them when the time comes. So Ridwan, could you just share your opinion of how digital rights relates to freedom and generally our everyday lives? Yes, um, thank you. Um, like Julia rightly said, um, digital rights are pretty much the traditional human rights that we know, but then transposing them to the digital environment. And the same way you have, um, if you single out specific human rights, for example, let's say right to privacy, 
there is a way these rights also find intersection on how it affects a couple of other human rights around even your freedom of movement, for example, freedom of expression, and quite a number of other rights that could impact. So it's the same way when you know when you talk about digital rights, which is basically saying, you know what, all these traditional rights that we've recognized, we need to also recognize that they extend beyond just um, the day-to-day -day interactions that we have to also in extend into the digital um, domain. So um, essentially, when you talk about things like, you know, um, right to privacy online, um, you also think about the intersection with freedom of expression. You think about how even freedom of movement, for example, how it could also impact the dignity of human person. And, you know, all of this cascade into so many domain sub thematic areas, which of course are then becoming um, a bit more compromising, becoming more a bit uh, more um, challenging. And I think why it's important that the conversation sort of get elated or elevated is also because of um, the facts on the ground, which is whether through government interference or through non-state actor interference with the exercise of these rights or the expression of these rights as we know them. So essentially, um, that's why you know um, we there's been so much. Um, I mean, not necessarily noise, but then there's so much conversation to bring attention. First, to recognize that these rights do exist. Of course, um, you have international bodies that have lent credence to the existence of these rights and why it's important to safeguard and protect them. But then when there is coalition between, direct coalition between, you know, whether state or non-state interference with these rights, and then of course, that's where the problem, as part of the problem, you know, um, starts, um, starts, how do I put that, start morphing out here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Ridwan. So you mentioned how state interference has come into play when it comes to digital rights and how people are able to ex access certain digital technologies and all of that. So looking at that aspect, and especially with regards to data protection, what do you think? Because a lot of the times in Africa, especially in recent times following the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen situations of governments hindering citizens' digital rights, they either through internet shutdowns, um, shutdowns of various social media, and then also probably limiting the internet connectivity generally. So when it comes to, when that usually happens, a lot of times citizens find ways to bypass that and still access certain technology. But then you find that the government finds a way to, we find that the government finds a way to still bring up new methods to curb citizens' digital rights and their access to digital technology. And most of the times they come up with the issue of how, okay, they are trying to curb hate speech or reduce disinformation. So what do you think citizens can do when governments use every means to curb these rights? Is it something that we need like the backing of the law or is it just about us amplifying our voices and trying to make ourselves heard? Ridwan, if you could share on that. All right, thank you. So, so um, again, if you look at the data out there and the facts on the ground as well, and also because of documented violations of um, these rights that you've seen in different parts of um, the world, whether it's through censorship, um, internet shutdowns, throttling of internet, filtering of content, um, whatever form of violation that you know that you've documented, um, what you find consistently is you know when state actors push narratives. Um, like you know, national security, public interest, and you know these really tough concepts that are often not defined. So, and you have you know broad. In some cases, you have broad provisions of laws that are interpreted to curtail the exercise of this right, and in some cases, these rights really don't exist. It's just some sort of executive action. So, um, I think the first key uh, element in the in the whole chain of the conversation is as people. First, we need to understand what the problems are. Um, in so many laws, if you look across um, different parts of the world, you find laws that enable government to roll back things like encryption um, without, you know, um, without safeguards in place. You have laws that embolden this government to conduct massive scale surveillance without safeguards in place. And you know, no one is saying you know human rights exist in, in, in vacuum, or maybe there are no cases where there are some sort of limits, especially when there are you know real issues that needs to be handled some way. And you know, even you find it in constitutions where these limits are drawn. But what you find is a case where the safeguards are not observed or the safeguards don't exist at all. So as a people, first we need to understand what the problems are. And this conversation for the academic community, this conversation for the civil society, for the digital rights community, 
where we need to simplify this concept. What does internet shutdown mean for people? What impact does it have on not just them commercially or economically, but also the quality of content they can assess, which of course then shape even the quality of opinion they can have. So we need to break down this concept, break down what these problems are, let people, so there's a whole lot that needs to go into awareness. The second bit is there's a whole lot of research that needs to be conducted using the facts on the ground, using data, um, and also, you know, exploring use cases of where these violations have been observed. Another thing that I would typically recommend is also, there's also a case or a place for strategic litigation. And we've seen it, um, especially from regional courts. Um, if, you use, um, if you use the African context, for example, you've seen the ECOWAS courts um, who have declared an internet shutdown in Togo, for example, to be legal, data suspension in Nigeria, for example, to you know, be unlawful to Nigeria's obligation under you know, African Human Rights Charter. So strategic litigation plays a significant role too because they help us define the line between what is right, what's wrong, what's permissible, what's not permissible. And of course, conversations like this are also important because again, when you have people who have become aware, they can then ask questions. And when they ask questions, then I think we're making progress. All right, thanks for that, Ridwan. So it's basically, we need to ask the questions that matter also, so that we are able to have these conversations and know that no matter what, digital rights can be achieved in spite of the limitations placed by governments. But Juliet, I'd like to hear your thoughts. As someone who works in research related to digital rights, what do you think? Because a lot of the times there are policies that have been put in place by government, also state actors. Like in Nigeria, for example, we have the NITDA coming up with the Data Protection Act and all of that. I'm pretty sure in Uganda also, there are certain policies that have been put in place. But how do we, because most times we tend to find that there's still a gap between these policies and their implementation, because these policies exist. We've already seen that research has been done on them. So how do we bridge this gap, like to make sure that this policy is actually implemented and for people to see actual results in their everyday life? Juliet. Okay, like, like you rightly pointed out, and the policies and laws, all, all of those fancy documents exist and they've existed for quite some time, but the implementation remains lacking. In those instances where the implementation does come into effect, it is under other suspect circumstances or to the detriment of various rights. And these include the right to privacy, access to information, you know, so there's the selective use of um, the various laws and frameworks, which is unfortunate because um, that is not what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be creating an environment through which the various rights can actually be realized in a safe uh, place online and in many cases offline as well. However, that isn't always the case. But also we have instances where we rely on outdated and irrelevant laws and apply them to the online space. So we are seeing cases where we are relying on laws created during the colonial period and using them in the digital age, um, like the Official Secrets Act of Uganda. This is a law that came out in the 50s, 60s, but we're applying it today and we use it to deny access to information, um, even though we're amongst the earlier countries in the continent to get actual to access to information law going. So we, we are caught in a situation where there's a lot of friction in what governments say, what they do, and what citizens need and want when it comes to the digital space. As you mentioned, um, we, we often see the case for protecting um, public, public, public uh, security um, as one of the arguments used to prevent the flow of information to We've also seen it being used um, as a case against um, the blocking of social media as a, game, as a case to encourage the taxation of social media. In 26, 2018, when the social media tax was introduced, we saw the president saying that the tax will reduce gossip on, <laughs> on the internet, on social media spaces. Gossip exists online and offline. That cannot be avoided. But we're not going shutting people down to stop them from talking. So there was a select narrative that was being pushed there, but its timing right ahead of elections was suspicious. So again, you know, the misuse of authority, um, the 
misuse of laws, um, as we have seen with the misuse of the Computer Misuse Act against public voices, um, voices like Stella Nyanzi, voices like Kakwenza, who have been very critical of the state and the various actors. Um, suddenly, the, the device upon which they used to make a, a stance or to pull, push out an argument is suddenly the platform against which they are arrested or persecuted. Um, but it's not only them, it is many across um, the continent. We've seen journalists, activists, um, you know, who have fallen victim to the very laws that are meant to be protecting their online spaces, um, protecting them against issues like cybercrime. But instead it's used, they're used to um, push back against freedom of expression and access to information, um, assembly in some instances. So very much a contradiction in the laws that we have at a time when we should be encouraging more people to have trust in the internet, to be more open towards voicing and challenging the states using the devices that they have, their phones, their tablets, their laptops, you know. Doing the, the states are with civil society are trying to push back against what the states are doing. But nonetheless, I think these are some of the dynamics that we need to be aware of. We have the laws in some instances, not all, not all laws, um, but the laws are being used against us. Um, and yes, as Ridwan had pointed out, we need to be documenting this. We need to be challenging um, what the state is doing. We need to be making recommendations on better laws and better uh, on best practice globally. Um, you know, and that pushback should be continuous. It's not a one, one off thing. And that is why I'm glad to have to be in such spaces where the community of individuals doing or interested in such work is, is constantly growing in the continent. Thanks for that, Juliet. So it's about us having this continuous conversations and always pushing back in spite of what the government does. And I particularly resonate with what you said about how the government says they do these things to probably curb gossip and all of that. As in the context of Nigeria, I know our president had a situation where after tweeting something that kind of incited genocide and his tweet was taken down, they ended up in us having Twitter ban. So most times when these things occur, they occur and then they last for a long period of time. And you also mentioned how when it comes to okay, policy and the gap in policy, a lot of the laws and policies that we're following are things that have been established since before, since the colonial era and all of that. So I'd like to know, do you think there's like an ideal worldview that should inform how we implement these policies? Is this something that should be in line with what is done in the international community or should it be more context-based like, okay, for Africa? And then even beyond just being for Africa, should it be more state specific for the different countries and different states in African countries? Julius, if you could share on that. It is a conversation that could be an entirely different webinar. But um, in, in a nutshell, we need to recognize that there are some global best practices that we need to adhere to instruments as guiding principles. We have uh, various international frameworks that, you know, people, the idea is the different states will, you know, adhere to them or follow them in principle. But we also need to recognize that. We are different in the different parts of the world when it comes to internet access. We cannot compare internet access in Africa to internet access in Europe. And as a result, you cannot assume that the digital literacy levels will be the same across the board. Nonetheless, the platforms are singular. We're all using TikTok, we're all using Google, we're all, you know, they're, they're just, they're, they're shared spaces, but there are various contextual differences that will always exist. And so in developing frameworks, those contexts need to be recognized. Um, and in recognizing them, we're creating, a, you know, a landscape that is more accommodating of people coming on and those already there. But what we are seeing now is in the landscape where we have least internet access, lower levels of digital literacy is where we're encouraging this pushback against internet use by having very regressive laws, by arresting people for having opinions 
online um, by not having suitable structures for women who face violence in online spaces, even though they're lowest in sub-Saharan Africa. So the way we address those issues will be very different to how Europe does it, for example. Um, so those are dynamics that we need to be finding more regional solutions to bring to the international um, platform as well. You know, so there's a common understanding that we're not having the Western world speak on behalf of other parts of the world with different um, dynamics happening there. But that also, even though these dynamics exist, they are known of in spaces outside of our own. So even in developing te technologies, even in developing frameworks, those dynamics are recognized and form and inform some of um, the solutions that could be pursued that inform the conversations and narratives that take place, not only in you know, local context, but inform um, discourse at an international level as well. Just because something is happening in the far corner of a room does not mean we do not need to know about it at the main table. We all need to be on the same page. In its absence, we remain caught in a conundrum of, of confusion when it comes to issues like content moderation, when it comes to understanding the dynamics between how a word, uh, rather an image, and uh, the text accompanying it are addressed when it comes to content moderation or the pulling down of content on various platforms. So, so yeah, it's it's a very weighty topic that needs a whole lot of interrogation, but at the core of it is, yes, we do need regional um, solutions and responses. We need national um, solutions and responses, but we cannot look at these in isolation. In so doing, we create silos, which will defeat the purpose of this shared space that we call the internet. Thanks for that, Juliet. Um, before I bring Ridwan in, once more, you could leave your questions in the comment in Q&A section and we'll attend to them. So Ridwan, with respect to what um, Juliet has said concerning how, in spite of the fact that we need to make sure that all um, laws guiding digital rights are more context specific, considering the level of internet access and level of internet penetration and how it keeps rising in Africa, I'd like to know when it comes to access, because a lot of times we're still facing issues related to the digital divide. And it's like, okay, as much as digital technologies are becoming more widespread, there are lots of people that don't have access to these things. And to an extent, this also leads to them not having access to information and also how to mitigate certain issues when the government infringes on their rights and all of that. So as someone who is involved in a lot of legal the legal aspects of digital rights, do you think something needs to be done to make sure that people have access across board, like to be able to combat the digital divide and also ensure that they have access to information at all times, Ridwan? Uh, I think um, Juliet has you know, set the tone going for, for, for the conversation and which is the fact that it's always very important that you know, we take context specific, um, we take context into cognizance when designing solution for a place. Um, for some parts of the world, um, you have above over 95% of the citizens who are connected to the internet. You go to the other part of the world, you see where the number pales um, significantly lesser if you try to do like drop parallels. So for them, key priority in a place like that will be to get more people online, get more people connected, and not just um, either get keep the way they access the internet, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of conversation at some point around things like net neutrality, zero rating, and now increasingly people can assess internet through just one corridor, which means the quality of opinion, the quality of access, also the objectiveness or the diversity in the kind of contents they can consume is limited. It's not, it's made very narrow. So that's the, that's like the, the so it's not just talking about access, it's also being able to ensure access equally, such that, um, internet traffic is not discriminated against. But then that also goes down to then you talk about things around bigger concepts like digital inclusion, um, acknowledging things like local context, language. Uh, people are not necessarily literate because they can assess content on the, some of the mostly widely spoken language in the world. A very big fraction of what can be assessed online can be is, is through the English language, for example. 
but it doesn't mean if you don't do it, you're not, you're, you're illiterate completely. So it's just that you may not be proficient in that language. So look at the bulk of contents that we have online. Um, they can only be assessed in some popular languages. So again, it means people who don't speak these languages are excluded. Again, you go to also, you know, amplify conversations around how exclusion people are also excluded because if you look at statistics, you'll find the divide between male and females, where you have more males could access phone that could probably access the internet and the females don't. So it's it's a, it's a broad conversation that when you keep breaking down the, you know, you keep breaking down the data, you keep seeing interesting facts emerge. So but for us, the priority will be first talking about broadband policies. How can we design broadband policies that can enable more people to connect to the internet? Because again, it's not enough having good broadband. Can people also afford it? And there's an entire conversation about internet affordability. You know, when you try to look across the globe, look at the cost of internet across the globe, look at what people spend in terms of also what they spend on feed, food, for example. And now all these things are competing with for uh, they are competing against the limited income from a typical household, for example. So it's a big conversation which requires a multi-stakeholder approach to you know finding an effective solution. On one hand, you can talk about government creating um, a really inclusive broadband policy that can allow people to make investments in communities where they can then access internet. There's a whole lot of conversation around affordability for devices, affordability to access internet. Um, there's conversations around even our communities now, initiatives from communities who are also building their own internet house and make sure that their own people can actually also get online, use digital services and you know all sorts of things. So um, it's a whole lot of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big conversation that first we need to identify what are the unique problems that we have. In your part of the world, is the problem just limited to people not being able to just access internet or is it the quality of the internet that is the problem? Or is it that the internet is filtered such that there's limit to what you can access? Or maybe there has been blocking of some things, um, different diversity for our diverse, that, that diversity of information, which the government has said, you know what, I don't want anyone to access you know, things like this, and we have to go through some backdoors to be able to get access. So again, identify the unique, what, convert, what part of the conversation is unique to you, and of course, design a solution from them. But then solution, again, it's, uh, it's going to require a multi-stakeholder approach, and not just, I mean, the government alone might not be able to entirely solve this, but then they have a significant role to play in terms of creating policies that can create some effective enablement for other actors to play, I mean, their own parts, and of course, you know, all of these problems from inclusion to exclusion issues to affordability to um, connectivity, and then we can begin to make sense of them and then address them appropriately. All right, thanks, thanks for that, Rick One. All you said just shows how much the what exists on the digital platforms is basically a reflection of what happens in real life and how we need to take a multi stakeholder approach to addressing all these issues. So when you, you actually mentioned something about how, if it's a, like an issue of the government censoring certain platforms or like surveilling using technology. So when it comes to state surveillance and how the government uses this to either control people and then also get kind of access to sensitive information surrounding maybe people's addresses, especially for people that work as probably journalists or opposition leaders. Do you think that there's a balance that needs to be struck between state surveillance and then actual data um, protection? Like should people, should the government continue to engage in state surveillance? Should it be condoned? Or is it something that needs to be eliminated as a whole? You know, that's to ensure okay. that it's privacy. All right, thanks. Um, so first thing is that there might be, so first thing is surveillance is a direct interference with the right to privacy. But the second thing also is that surveillance may be legitimate. There may be a legitimate need for surveillance. You know, talk about things like prevention of, you know, the most severe crimes, prevention of terrorism, investigating the most severe crimes, for example. There may be a legitimate reason to do, to conduct um, surveillance. But where the big question typically is, is what approach do we have to surveillance? So in a research we did when we looked at about six African countries last year, what we found was that safeguards, which have become recognized under you know, international rules around communication surveillance, whether the UN draft principles, um, there's also the principle of proportionality and necessity um, by the EFF, and there's also the African Declaration of Freedom of Expression and um, Access to Information, which gives 
you know, provide broad safeguards around how surveillance can be conducted and in which these human rights can then still be preserved. So principles like ensuring transparency, um, making sure, you know, people are aware um, at some stage, you know, not necessarily, or giving them even a room to appeal if there's a need to. You know, principles around ensuring that when you conduct surveillance is embedded in a law, conducting human rights impact assessment before deploying surveillance tools. You know, there have been so many reports or use cases of, you know, NSO tools like, um, NSO tool like the Pegasus. Um, white, I mean, if you look at what the, um, there's a Canadian institution that's done phenomenal work around, you know, tracking use cases of surveillance by, you know, government um, state actors across the world. And you find a lot of governments who have actually, you know, deployed these tools, but then without necessarily any human rights concerns. So again, we've seen documented cases where they've gladly been used against dissidents, they've been used against opposition members, they've been used against um, people who don't support the government or who speak against the government. So, and again, people, law enforcement agencies literally just, you know, deploy these tools as the will of whoever it is that's making, calling the shots. So the safeguards that we expect are things that are often missing. Um, are we, is, is there an independence judicial review for surveillance or is it that surveillance are conducted without warrants? Or even if you have to do it without warrant because maybe of expediency, is it that you document, you go back to the court to get some sort of a review? Is there like an independent oversight body that even looks at what both the courts are doing and what the law enforcement agencies are doing? So often than not, what we found at the end of that research was that in many cases, in the six countries we looked at, these safeguards are typically absent. And one interesting case is in, in South Africa, for example, you find where the principal law on surveillance, for example, part of it was the, the, the concept is, is invalid because they encourage mass surveillance. So often than not, what you get is, again, if you look at, in, in, in so many of these countries that we looked at again, you find a situation where surveillance laws are doing out in different body of laws rather than, you know, having it, what is recommended in having it a single body of law, so precision, you can have precision. So you have laws creating different law enforcement agencies or intelligence agencies, granting them, you know, of, of fettered power to do some things. In some cases, you find laws where you say, oh, um, um, the, 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 the warrant of the courts or the approval of the courts is required. In some cases, it's not required. You see laws that rolls back or either weaken things like encryption or encourage breaking of encryption. You know, laws that take away even the right to anonymity without necessarily judicial review and all of that. So these are the problems. So it's not that surveillance can be done. Surveillance can be done, but then it must be done within the confines of the safeguards that should exist in these laws. All right, thank you for that, Ridwan. So I see we have two questions in the Q&A section. Juliet, if you would help us with this, I'll just read out the question. So the first question is from Amari. I hope I got the pronunciation correct. She says, the issue is very interesting and timely, but when it comes to our continent, I don't think it would be implementable. It would be abused because of the little orientation we have on how to access it, but I'm not pessimistic. What do you think about its implementation? So I'm guessing Hamari is referring to when it comes to the laws and the implementation. Juliet, if you could. Um, okay. okay um... I'm looking at the question, but I'll, I'll speak broadly to, to a lot, to the various laws that have come out. Um, perhaps um, I see the concern that you have, the mistrust when it comes to our, to our continent on thinking things may not be implementable. But surprisingly, some things are. Um, sometimes some things take a bit longer than we'd like them to, um, but we should, you know, hold that, that light of change. Um, and that is what we're seeing slowly happening in some of uh, our cases. Like I said, Uganda, for example, got an access to information law back in 2005. That law sat largely dormant up until 2011, 2011, when the regulations for it were uh, introduced. Um, and now people are slowly building awareness of their right to information. The state has also created the government interaction center through which um, it now proactively releases information. 
So it's taken a long time from 2005 to get to this point. And yes, the state is not releasing everything that it should, but it's releasing um, something. And the onus now is on us as citizens to pressure them for more. Um, but that, that is just an example of the possibility that lies with many of the laws, not just access to information. The same lies with what Tridwan has, has just been talking about, about data privacy. Um, the laws are there, they're abused. We do not have any oversight mechanisms, but we can demand for data privacy or surveillance rather to be pursued in a necessary and proportionate way, not just be blatantly abused. Um, and that is possible if we have the right systems in place. However, if we let states go unchallenged, then they will do whatever they want. Um, so the onus is on us to keep um, raising public concern, uh, raising, putting out public commentary on this, applying the pressure for change um, to get to the point that we want to be at. But ultimately, we want laws that are necessary and used in a proportionate manner, not blatantly abused, which is what many of these laws currently do. And in so doing affect um, our basic rights, our basic rights of access, our ba basic rights of security online, of freedom of expression. Of, yes, there's, there's, there's a whole, whole lot that we let go by when we do not um, challenge the state on the problematic provisions that it has in many of the laws that are released. Um, Ridwan is the lawyer between the two of us. <laughs> so I'm sure you could write an entire book about all of this. But nonetheless, all I'm saying is that um, unless we let things go unchallenged, then we'll remain in the same situation that, um, that we're currently in. I see a comment, just a moment. Okay. Uh, oh, you would like an elaboration on implementation. So like, like, like pointed out earlier, implementation sometimes just takes a long time. But like, like I've previously mentioned, we need to apply pressure to get to the point of implementation. We sometimes see a sporadic implementation, which is not what we want, but a consistent implementation on the laws that we have. But the implementation must be conducted in the correct manner. So we'll have um, a country like Uganda saying, oh, no, we've got a cyber law in Uganda that we're regularly using. But how are we using it? Are we using it to the detriment of digital rights or using it to create an enabling environment for people to be online? And in so doing, curbing down on cybercrime, for example, addressing um, the various tech concerns that people have when they come online, like um, ensuring that financial technology perhaps is actually a secure space to conduct business in Uganda. Um, you know, so those are the, the dynamics that we'd like to, to see when it comes to implement, in, implementation of the laws, that it's not used against individuals, but used to the benefit of the larger community um, in online spaces. I, I, hope, I hope that clears it up for you, Amari. Thanks, Juliet. I think that should do it. Um, so I noticed Ridwan also had something to say on that, but before you share on that, particular question about implementation. I don't know if you could add this question to your response. There's also a question about, an anonymous person says, can you address on the issue to do with copyrights? So if you could talk about the implementation and then also copyrights and the legal aspects of that when it comes to digital rights. Okay, yeah, I, mean, I was going to speak to you. I was, actually, I was actually going to ask Julia to take, the, you know, take that question initially. So that was why I felt like I interfered. But for implementation, um, Half of what is needed is typically the political will, um, not only political will on the side of the government to you know, drive enforcement or creating good body of law. It's also the fact that when you want to engage, engage meaningfully. You, know, you can't call it engagement when people don't even have an idea of what they want to discuss before you call them into a room to come and discuss. That's not engagement. That's loving the sound of your own voice. So, um, so implementation is some way um, driven largely by political will, the fact that um, policymakers need to understand that they can actually learn a lot from people on ground, learn a lot from people who these policies will affect, will affect. And again, what is actually the end goal? Are you trying to, I mean, you can raise legitimate in like, yeah, information disorder is a problem, 
but your response to information disorder will not be clamping down on the space for people who have legitimate views to not have a room to express them. So again, it's about understanding, doing your regulatory impact assessment, speaking to the real stakeholders, and having meaningful engagement, which of course this engagement can then influence or shape policies, not just sit down somewhere, draft something that the Supreme Leader loves, and then you push it down people's necks, say, well, this is what the law should be. That's more meaningful engagement. And the second bit around um, how does this really impact um, you know, intellectual property rights broadly? Yes, they could do, uh, because again, if you look at things around content moderation, takedown, notice, and appeal, um, there are times that what is being asked to take down could be proprietary content. So again, it's why it's important to have laws that first define what the liabilities of intermediaries could be, um, laws that also facilitates the prospect of taking down um, content that potentially could violate, you know, um, intellectual property, whether it's copyright, whatever manifestation of, you know, intellectual property rights that you see there. Um, but it's also important to know that um, these policies also play an important role, even in content creation. So I'll give some examples. Um, last year, there was an amendment to the Nigerian Film, Video, and Censor Board Law, which um, made it, included a provision like anyone that, you know, first, he expanded the scope to now in specific because it was it was a law that was developed so many years ago before you know we have like big digital environment as we have it today. So first, he include he expanded the scope to you know cover digit, um, um, intermediate sorry uh, intermediaries, um, um, video platforms, SVO I mean video on demand platforms and you know all these digital platforms. So but then he said every single content should be licensed. But then the people who drafted this particular provision forgot that on some of these platforms, contents are driven by user-generated contents. So how do you get, YouTube, for example, averagely gets millions of hours of videos, maybe in a day or in a minute. I mean, I can't specifically remember what the statistics is. So how do you approve every single user-generated content in that sense? Like, think about the practicability of enforcement. I know sometimes we could get, I mean, obsessed with trying to regulate the big players and we lose sight of you know small players or how impractical or how difficult some things could be in terms of operationalizing them. So again, uh, when we say meaningful engagement in terms of getting an opinion into quality of the law, is also because you need to learn from experience of people. You need to learn how technically these platforms actually behave, for example, if what you're trying to do is to regulate platforms, but not just giving out laws that is actually very difficult to operationalize and impractical to operationalize. Of course, there are always genuine legitimate reasons why regulations are needed. But again, political will is not just the will to enforce because um, it allows you to shut opinions or people can speak freely about your government or people can express views about what you don't like. It's about also making sure your political will also goes into getting, I mean, uh, meaningful engagement and also reflecting in the quality of the law that you know are, are being issued, and that means when you do that, you are also creating independent agencies that can enforce the law properly. You are you are you are supporting the agency with the resource that they need, both human and financial. You are creating an oversight to also make sure they are also accountable. So that's 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 why I think about it. Thank you, Ridwan. So that's basically separating independent corporations from state influence. Thanks for that. So we have a question. We're running out of time though, but we'll just take this question. I have a question from Karim in the chat. Karim says, is there a difference between limiting digital rights and freedom of expression? Juliet, if you could answer that, please. Sorry, the question is, is there a difference between limiting digital rights and freedom of expression, right? Yes, that's the question. The two are so heavily interlinked that if you limit one, you're limiting the other, right? Um, if you limit freedom of expression, then you are essentially reducing the voice that one has to advocate for digital rights. You are reducing the voice that one has to be an active member of um, the digital citizenship, uh, or to own the digital citizen citizenship rather. 
So, no, in my opinion, if you reduce one, either way of the spectrum, you are essentially reducing um, the, the impact of the other. They're so deeply interlinked um, that we cannot remove one and hope for the best for the other. Uh, read one, what do you think about that? Uh, I think what I would say to that is, you know, like yeah. rightly defined. It's agree the, as uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'll, I'll probably just take from what you said already, and you know, the opening, the opening remark you made about digital rights being a personal right, as we know them, but then in digital environment. So, freedom of expression online is just one of these rights. Uh, you know, you call broadly under under digital rights. So, and have you rightly said, you know, that there's some sort of intersection. Um, because it, you can consider it whether a thematic area or thematic expression, or um, you can consider it the theme under you know digital right broadly. Freedom of expression online is also um, that that's the way I see freedom of expression online. It's just one of those rights where you have access to information and where you have privacy and you know a couple of other rights that exist in the digital domain. All right, thanks for that. So Juliet, considering how um, the ECOWAS ruling on the Twitter ban in Nigeria, how the outcome was, and then also considering the fact that a lot of our audience are generally young policy advocates and also journalists. Um, I'd like to ask you, like, what advice would you give to young journalists and activists on how to actually make their voices heard when it comes to demanding accountability from government when they actually carry out these acts that violate um, data privacy and also digital rights? Like when internet shutdowns are done or when generally limitations are placed on people and their access to digital technology, what can we actually do to ensure that governments do not carry out this act again? Sorry, I, I lost my connection momentarily, but I think I heard my name, yes? Okay, now it's a fantastic lineup that you have. Uh, people who are entering in the world of policy and the media. My, I fully fit into that bracket, uh, coming from a background in journalism and being in the policy space. Um, so I am very much um, excited to be here. But one of the key things from a journalistic perspective is documenting, telling the stories, not only to your immediate audience, but you know, sometimes you the story cannot even get out of the country um, when everything is shut down, but it has to be documented. The human story needs to be told. What happens when there's an internet shutdown? In the case of Uganda, we had mobile money transactions also shut down. So people couldn't send money to pay their hospital bills. They couldn't travel. They couldn't pay their school fees. So there's a human aspect that sometimes goes untold. We focus so much on the policy arguments and the human is, you know, uh, there are many stories that, that could be told there and not enough of them actually emerge, especially those of people living in rural communities, especially of those who do get impacted by shutdowns, for example, even though they do not even access the internet. Um, you know, so there is a knock-on effect that um, goes, goes untold, and um, we need to bring up those cases to support the policy arguments that we take forward. Policy needs, policy it relies on arguments, it relies on evidence. So we need to ensure that the evidence base is constantly in a state of being docu you know, populated rather. And um, that is a role played by both policymakers and their community, as well as by those in the media and the extension of, uh, of the networks that they, they, they happen to be working in. But yeah, so for both, we need to ensure that we're documenting changes in the laws, changes in the frameworks and policies, we need to be documenting or rather complementing these with the human aspect. And that is where the journalists um, come into play. Um, but that doesn't mean we leave it just to the journalists. Um, there are various other actors, the academia, there is the creative industry, for example, there's the sports fraternity. We never you know, think about all these other potential allies in this greater scheme of the digital rights arena, yet they all have a role to play and contributions to make when it comes to advocating for change for where we want to see where we need to be going when it comes to the digital rights um, landscape. And so, yeah, we just need to recognize that, you know, our network or rather our community is bigger than we perceive it to be. 
beyond policy and journalists, for example, policymakers and journalists, for example. Um, we have allies even within government who really want to see a change in how things are done to make the work easier, for example. Um, we have allies within law enforcement who are caught between a wall and a hard place <laughs> because of situations that they keep being pushed into by the state. We have the telcos who lose profits every time the internet is shut down or social media is shut down or when more taxes are introduced to, to the services that they're offering. So, you know, this community needs to keep growing. The documentation needs to be constant and consistent and also needs to be clever in where um, it seeks sourcing from. Like I said, sometimes we see communities who are not online, but are still affected by internet shutdowns. Um, a specific case, like I mentioned earlier, would be those who are affected by the mobile money shutdown, which always um, is shut down in tandem with social media shutdowns in a country like Uganda. Um, mobile money is used by, the, by a largely informal society who may not necessarily be online, but who are heavily, heavily affected when the access to finance is blocked for no reason that they feel um, they, they are aware of. So yeah, documentation through and through is what I stand for and is what I encourage even in this space. I mean, this right here is a, is a form of documentation. This recording is a form of content generation. We barely have enough con content coming from the continent, but this is being put in online spaces and it's serving as a point of reference, a point of learning for those who will come online and find it waiting there for them with the insights that are being shared, the questions that are being asked. Um, so there's lots to do, lots happening, lots being done, including right now. And uh, yeah, let's let's keep the momentum going. Thank you for that, Juliet. So documentation and also considering the human aspect. So read one as a final word. I don't know if you could just weigh in on this also from the from the perspective of a legal practitioner. What can young policy makers and journalists do when the government tries to hinder their, their digital rights? Yeah, I mean, um, I echo, you know, um, the role of documentation is always very important because, again, um, we can design policies without the internet. We just want to do the same um, old way we've criticized. Uh, but I think another thing would also be understanding the issues. Um, and, you know, you don't just have, when, when you're creating policy, you don't just need people who have knowledge of law. You also need people who understand the technical component of what is designed to be regulated. Because, again, this often gets missing in the context. And that's why, you have policies, you have procedures that it's literally difficult to operationalize in a technical environment. So um, as policymakers, so we need to talk to ourselves. Uh, we need to hear each other. Let the technical state, I mean, community, let them have a role. Let the legal community have a role. Um, let people who are vested in policy themselves, let them have a role. Let the, let's listen to the academic world. Um, engage people who these policies will also impact or who the policy or the lack of policy or the existence of certain policy is also impacting to understand their story and what is actually doing to them. So I'm back with data, which of course, um, documentation as Julia has said, I think would really encourage, but uh, for young people trying to break into policy, it's always been very important to you know, stay abreast of developments in different parts of the world. There's so much you benefit from learning from what's happening in different parts of the world. Some you'll be able to successfully transpose, some you need some local context to transpose them into you know, your local conversation. Um, also important to you know read widely, and you know read about the different dynamics, different. I mean, a problem might not be unique or so popular in this part of the world, but you actually do exist. And one of those big things, for example, is when you talk about things like deceptive design, it does exist, but then there's not so much big conversation around it here. So look at these not so popular conversations, learn about them, see where they exist, document them, and of course, best engagement. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Ridwan. So I see we have just one, a few questions in the Q&A section. So Julius, if you could just address this in like two minutes, because we're running out of time. A question from Abimbola Emmanuel. He says, can something be said about the relationship, can something be said about what the relationship should be between digital platforms and national governments going forward? Is there a legitimate reason to insist on territorial presence as required by the Nigerian government? 
or should digital platforms remain immune to national territorial requirements? So yeah, I think this person is talking in respect with the government's mandate for certain social media platforms to have presence in the country so that they could actually regulate them better. So Julius, if you could shed some light on that. Yes, so this indeed is a raging debate. Um, should a Facebook have an office in, in Nigeria? Should a Twitter have an office in Nigeria? Um, currently, it's being debated through the lens of taxation, um, seeing that a lot of business is being conducted in, in, on, on platforms and um, with many arguing that the state is losing um, in this respect. And so there's been arguments that... Um, such platforms need to have um, an office you, for taxation purposes. Not that it, it also depends on the legal landscape of um, the specific countries. But now we're also seeing the issue around regulation or you know, once they're closer to home, what does that mean with regards to government interference? It's a whole lot easier, one would assume. Um, but yeah, so it's, it really is treading on murky waters. It's an argument that has also been presented in Uganda. It's an argument that has been used for the case of shutting down um, uh, internet access, but also it's been used as one of the cases for introducing the social media taxation because platforms are not in the country. So it really is... Uh, a debate that needs a whole lot more interrogation. Like I said earlier, different countries, different regions have very different contexts and behave very differently economically. They behave very, very differently politically. And bearing that in mind, how we move forward with such an issue around bringing or having in-country presence is, is something that needs to be treaded carefully as the consequences may be dire if not done well. And again, with the necessary and proportionate measures in place. So we shouldn't rush to have such decisions made without intensive multi-stakeholder engagement. You know, there needs to be that deliberate challenging from all corners or rather from all actors to get to a point where we're all comfortable with having such a decision made and um, we're ready to face the consequences good, hopefully, for all, um, should we pursue such, such an avenue. But we also need to think of it in terms of broader, broader developments taking place, like the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement, like uh, PRIDA, what do all these decisions mean? So the lens needs to be widened much more than what we're currently looking at some of these issues. Um, with and I think um, for policy policymakers like you guys coming into the space, um, I think these are some of the debates that you're going to be having to deal with in in due course. I think for some countries it's still relatively early. Take for example a country like Ethiopia, which has only just opened up its second telecommunications um, service operator, and this is to a country with with over 100 million population. Um, so, you know, we're neighboring countries, but behaving very differently. Um, hence, the need to tread very carefully at a global, regional and national level when it comes to some of these decisions. So be guided by policy, the need to be guided a whole lot more by, by data. Thank you so much, Julia, for that. And thank you also, Rikwan. So we're out of time. So we'll just round up.